afternoon and hello everyone. Thank you for being here with us today with starting from square one in collaboration with the Balsa Foundation. We are so grateful for our partnership and our partnerships with Balsa. Every month we showcase amazing leaders in the ecosystem and today is no exception. My name is Ricky Henry and I am the program manager for the Center for Emerging Technologies, the largest and oldest innovation center in the state of Missouri. The Center for Emerging Technologies is nationally recognized and providing infrastructure and types of resources for early stage entrepreneurs, businesses through all of our signature programs, one in particular, the Square One Ignite and Square One Bootcamp, as well as workshops, seminars and other educational programs, often done in partnership with other ecosystem partners. We are also so happy to be the host of the monthly House of Genius events. While I have you here, I'd like to invite you to check us out on our startup toolkit that includes trainings and other materials for viewing. We have also recently launched a television show that I am so excited about in collaboration with STL TV titled Fuel and Innovation. So be sure to check out two of our episodes, episodes one and two, and stay tuned for a third, highlighting amazing entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. I'll also share that information in the comments. We would love for you to give us your feedback and any past graduates of the Square One program that's listening today, please, 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 if you have interest, please let me know. Fuel and Innovation is the TV show. And now what we have all been waiting for, please welcome our amazing guests, Tashara Earl and Raymond Milan, Millen, I'm sorry. First, I want to bring um, Tashar Earl to the stage and give you just a little bit of information about Tashara. Tashara is a 2019 graduate of the Square One Bootcamp. She's a native St. Louisan. She is a very passionate serial entrepreneur. One amazing thing to, about Tashara is she is the co-founder of two great tech startups, Tech Train and Public Safety Innovation. The two tech startups provide innovation safety wearable technology products for the outdoor enthusiasts and public safety officials. Tashara is also the founder and CEO of Shades of Color a mobile application for the self-made beauty. Wow. Which is an interactive lifestyle business app designed to encourage and self-love with the self-power of beauty. Tashara is an advocate for her community. Tashara is a member of many, many community organizations, one of which she's the president of Revitalization Baden Association. And she is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated St. Louis Metropolitan Chapter. Tashara, wow. When do you have time to sleep? <laughs> you are amazing. Yeah. I wanna first thank you and uh, kind of welcome you to our stage. When do you have time? Oh, share with us some of, 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 of your amazing stories and, and share a, li a little bit about your business. Yes, thank you so much, Ricky, for inviting me to this platform. Square One Bootcamp has really helped us with our business and our startup. And so I cannot thank you enough for bringing me back up here to share um, some of my experiences and insight. And I try to get sleep. I, it's a lot of prior, prioritization where I have to schedule things and also say no to other things. But yes, um, it's amazing to be here. So um, thank you for that awesome bio that you just did for me too. So I'm looking forward to um, letting everybody in the audience know about my experience with Square One Bootcamp. Uh, 
Oh, Ricky, I think you may be on mute. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> so, Tashara, um, just share with us kind of your involvement with Square One. What was your experience like? How was it? It was mind blowing. So, as you mentioned, I am a graduate of the 2019 cohort. Shout out to us. We definitely had some amazing startups and businesses coming out of there and i still connect with my cohorts today seeing all of the amazing things that they're doing and so i uh, myself and my co-founder antonio julius we were actually introduced to square one boot camp through our advisor mark bowers and so the connection with him actually came from made stl as well so it started from just going to a facility to see how they can help us to build out our prototype and then that transitioned to us to being connected to mark bowers which connected us to square one boot camp and when i say that that was the amazing best 10 weeks of my life <laughs> i enjoyed it i enjoyed every presentation every meetup every um Oh, the food that we got <laughs> with it being in person we had the advantage of getting um food that was uh catered from local st louis businesses so that was a pleasure because i'm a foodie but as far as the resources to truly help our startup to build a consumer good product and especially dealing with manufacturing and also with our product it deals with textile fashion wear, but then also electronics and trying to pair that together, that could be difficult. So Square Own Bootcamp has really been a support system for us to get connected. Thanks for the, the, the pub on the food, Tashara. We didn't really have good food. Um, that's great. I'm glad you really connect with your entrepreneurs because that's one part of the experience, the connectivity and the relationship. So that is great to know. Um, with all of that and the connectivity, kind of share with us some of the lessons that you learned um, to kind of inform you about that informed you about like what type of business, you know, you really you had. Yes. Yeah, so um, Christy, who started off, she kickstarted Square One Bootcamp for us. Um, she had talked to me about when you are growing a business, identifying what type of business you're growing. And one lesson that I would say that was a takeaway for me was to understand the difference between a small business and a fast growth company. And so a fast track growth company. And so with our startup, we're actually a fast track growth company. Um, with that being said, you know, a lot of those companies kind of uh, take off into the unicorn status um, of businesses. And so identifying that, that also lets you know your progress and how quickly you need to make decisions or where you need to slow down. Um, one other lesson that I will say is it's okay to not know everything. Um, to be honest, it's very humble when you don't know everything and that you actually go out there to find the experts that are in that area. And so dealing with an invention that you are creating, something that's never been done before, or you may be creating something that has been out there, but you're tweaking it, you're adding something to that. And so you want to find ways to protect your ideas that you have. And so that was something through Square One Boot Camp is understanding and identifying how we can protect. Um, so one of the classes that we did was learning about intellectual property. And so that was extremely important because before Square One Boot Camp, I just knew of the name or the word intellectual property, but I didn't know everything that went into it. <laughs> and then also how you actually go about having that conversation with an attorney. When do you do that? Um, so some people will, and I will say we, we actually did this. Um, there is a stipulation with selling your product before you get patented. That actually from something that I had learned was you actually can't sell that product until you get that application in for your patent process. If you do, I think it kind of knows and voids or it's, it, it does something with um, the process of you getting approved for it. So that was a great lesson because 
our product that we have, that was everything for our business. And if we decided to sell something before we started the application, we would have lost, you know, some things that we couldn't gain back after doing that. That's great that you you actually attacked that head on before it kind of went down a rabbit hole, right? Because that could have been detrimental to yes. your, your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, square one, we can do that sometime. We can shake you up a little bit, right? To make sure mm -hmm. that you, you don't go down that rabbit hole. Of course. So with you learning that experience, with you having that experience from square one, uh, Tashara, how would you... How could you, could you share with us, I'll say, um, of like, when, when did it come to your mind um, when you needed to even hire an attorney? I mean, I know you said that you, you figured it out when you, you learned kind of that process with Square One, but when did you know or decide that it was time to hire an attorney that dealt with intellectual properties? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so... Our team identified when we needed to talk and hire a patent attorney is when we were met with the demand of, of someone wanting to purchase our product. And so we wanted to protect our idea so that it could, um, so that we could potentially watch out for competitors. Um, and so I would say as soon as someone was interested in our product, we were like, okay, Okay, we got the demand. Now we need to go talk to a patent attorney. And with that being said, too, um, the price can vary with who you are connecting with. There are different uh, firms out here that have different price points for um, helping you to file that application. So I would say as soon as we knew that somebody was interested in buying our product, that's how we knew we needed to go um, to hire a patent attorney to file that application so that we can actually start selling it, you know, eventually that's re that's really really interesting because you knew that you couldn't really sell anything until you actually kind of land uh, the person to help you so that you wouldn't go down uh, a dangerous path yes most definitely well good good what steps did you take to select the attorney what did you like do just a process of elimination was it somebody that the square one kind of connected you with just kind of how did that come about and what was the outcome yeah, so pretty much in regards to word of mouth and also doing your research and reviewing firms around St. Louis, um, we hired our patent attorney through word of mouth and referral. And that actually did come out of um, a connection with Square One Bootcamp, but then also a connection with Arch Grants too. And so from there, uh, we were connected with Bella, who is our patent attorney with Affordable um, patent attorneys. And she has since helped us to file um, four of our patent applications. So our we have design patents and also utility patent um, applications out there too. So I take it that the relationship was amazing that you made with Bella. Oh, of course. She is a rock star. She truly has educated us on the process. Um, in addition to the when it comes to your claims and what you are putting into that patent application, she really walks us through how to work towards getting a successful patent application so it can get approved versus the prosecutor uh, declining it. So she tries to put us in the best position. So the relationship with Bella is awesome. Well, great. I am so happy. I am so happy. Um, Tashara, we're going to come back to you after we have a little bit, uh, have a little talk with our expert, um, Mr. R Mr. Raymond Maline. Um, mm -hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and I want to get audience, I really want to give you a little bit of information about um, Ray, as he's called, um, our, our expert today. So thank you, Tashara. We'll be back with you in a moment because I yes, know some of, welcome. The, the audience has some amazing questions because I do. <laughs> Raymond Maline was named one of the world's 300 leading IP strategists by intellectual assets management. That is a lot, Ray. Like, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, Ray has uh, a wealth of information about him. He was previously the chief of IP um, for Volvo, the car corporation, and CEO of Volvo, 
Volvo uh, Car Venture in Sweden. Like, how did you do it, Ray? You are an awesome man. Um, carefully. Carefully. <laughs> carefully. I mean, he, he's been a part of GE Oil and Gas and, and Express Scripts and, man, and, I mean, Express, um, American Express. I mean, just on and on and on. Um, but he was formally educated, of course, um, with a computer science degree from Columbia University uh, and a JD from George Washington Law School. Um, Ray is um, a renowned lecturer and uh, has spent many years on several boards and been directors of boards and Jess is has a wealth of knowledge on the IP. So without further ado, I would like to bring to our virtual stage, Raymond Maline. Wow, Ray, like impressive career journey guy. Oh, thanks, Ricky. And and yeah, it's uh, it's million. You know, we, we'll just go with million. The English pronunciation will, will yeah, the, the French is tough sometimes. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> Um, but you know, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here. Um, you know, Harness Dickey, uh, the, uh, our, our law firm has uh, supported this organization for some time, as you mentioned, and we're also always happy to uh, donate some time. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Harness Dickey is a hundred year old, uh, um, a three hundred person uh, law firm that deals only with intellectual property, and we have offices in St. Louis, uh, Detroit, where I am today. Uh, in Washington, D.C., and also in Dallas, Texas. Um, so that's our firm. And uh, Tashara, I mean, you know, I love your energy, and I could really tell you're a startup founder because uh, you're very extroverted, and that's what startup founders usually are. Um, but you really did my job for me today, right? You started talking about that one of the great things that you learned at Square One Boot Camp was pretty much intellectual property. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to talk about it from sort of like a, you know, you know, one thing you don't know is all intellectual property lawyers that practice patent law, we have to go to engineering school first, then we go to law school, then we take the state bar, then we have an extra bar exam to pass at the patent office. Um, so, but today I don't want to talk like a IP, like a geek or a intellectual property geek, right? What, what I want the audience to know that Tashara really set up for is when you're about to start a company, right? Think about it. Why do you start a company? Right, well, okay, first of all, it's to make money. I get that, all right, great. You wanna feed your family, you know, put some kids through school, you know, buy mama a house, I get it, right? But once you pass the monetary thing, why do you start a company? You start a company because you have an idea to do something, right? And that idea to do something, it could be for a product or it could be for a service. But let's take the product, let's make it simple. Let's talk about a product. If you have an idea for a product, that product you believe is new right? It's an invention, right? And Tashara mentioned that the invention is really the center of your startup, right? So when you do, when you have a new product that you want to give to the marketplace, that new product is either bigger or smaller, it's faster or slower, right? You know, depending on the right adjective, whatever the improvement you're making, right? Sometimes the improvement is to make it bigger. Sometimes the improvement is to make it smaller. Sometimes the improvement is to make it slower or faster. Whatever the right adjective is, whatever the secret sauce is to make that product better, that you're gonna raise funding on, that you wanna get your first sale and you wanna eventually exit, right? Nowadays, you wanna you know, do a SPAC and IPO or you wanna get bought by Apple or Google or Facebook or Amazon or Microsoft. What protects that product is intellectual property, right? It could be the way the product looks, design patents. It could be the way the, the, way the product works, utility patents. It could be the cool name for the product, trademarks. It could be the way the code be, uh, behind the product works, copyrights, right? It could be that, uh, you know, maybe you're even starting a, a, um, a, a local bakery and you have, a, you know, some recipe for some bomb cookies, right? That's a trade secret, right? Like the recipe for Coca-Cola or the recipe for, uh, uh, for KFC or Popeyes or whatever the case may be. So intellectual property is really the first thing that you have to take care of, right? And you have to make sure that you're putting a wall around that product because else, what's, what are people gonna do? They're gonna copy it, right? And then they'll be off to the races, like, and you won't be the exclusive person selling that or offering that in a, in a marketplace. So intellectual property is really important to protect your product from people outside and also people from inside, right? You know, if you know the story of how Facebook was founded, right? You know, a lot of people say that the idea was taken from one dorm room to another and it was launched and, you know, there were some battles of who owned the idea. 
right? So there are things like non-disclosure agreements when you're going to tell your friends or people who are going to give you funding to make sure that they don't disclose the idea to other people before you have a chance to see your patent attorney, get your website up, get your prototypes done, and, and you're way far down from making your first sale. So I'm going to stop there, uh, Ricky, and you know, I'll take questions, but again, the, what we do the intellectual property is really protect the core idea of why somebody like Tashara even decides, you know, because I'm sure, you know, she's brilliant enough to go work for anybody, but she wanted to go work for herself and do something because she had an idea. And how do you protect that idea? And that's intellectual property. Well, Ray, you took all the questions right out of my <laughs> mouth. I mean, just right out of my mouth. You can you, do some more. <laughs> you're great. You're great. Yeah. So, right. Just, I do have a couple of questions just okay. for you. You really kind of took everything that I plan to, to ask you, kind of just and wrapped it up really, really in a really, really nice package. Mm -hmm. um, so, thank you for that. But I do want to ask you, like, when when you when you deal with a startup, like kind of what are your first like attacks or not attacks, but approaches to even helping a person like Tashara that like had no knowledge of anything? Like what is that first approach? Because of course they're, you know, entrepreneurs, they're like, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. But they really don't know what they want to do. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, the approach from a good intellectual property attorney is no different than the approach of a venture capitalist who's going to fund the company, right? So the first thing we want to know is what is your business plan, right? You know, what makes this so special, right? What makes it faster, bigger, slower, what, you know, uh, you know, whatever, what's the, what's the secret sauce and how do you plan to make money? And then once you understand how you plan to make money and what your business plan is, then it's our jobs as the intellectual property attorneys to put barriers to other people copying the secret sauce or the secret formula or what makes that product special. So the beginning is always what's the business plan, right? And sometimes it's, take, it's telling founders like Tashar, look, I know you have a million ideas, you want to do a million things, but you know, let's 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 have a coffee, let's slow down, tell me what your business plan is, and that, what's the first way you're going to make money, right? And the, and then and once we figure out how you're going to make money, let's figure out what the path to that is, and how we can protect you at every point, right? Your path. The first thing is you're going to need funding. Right. So, OK, so let's get some non-disclosures before you disclose it to outside people. Right. Then, you know, you're going to want to go get uh, um, prototypes done. Right. You may not have the engineering wherewithal to make prototypes. Right. So let's get some NDAs in place and let's get our service agreement for the person who's actually doing the prototype. Right. And that service agreement will say, well, if the person tells you, oh, you know, you said that this has to be five inches, but it really works best at two and a half, that that service agreement, that that those ideas that they're improving your product actually be, come back and belong to you, right? Um, and then from there, it's like, okay, let's file some patent applications, right? It could be design, it could be utility, right? Or, or maybe we decide, maybe the secret sauce is in a server somewhere in the cloud, and maybe we don't need a patent application on that part, we just need a patent application on the part the consumer is gonna see on their phone. So we come up with that strategy, right? And then, okay, how are you gonna brand it? Then we create, okay, so, um, well, you want to call it McDowell's, but you know, hey, there's a McDonald's out there. You know, why spend ten thousand dollars when you're going to get shut down down the road? So let's clear the name. Let's file a trademark uh, application on your name, right? And then so we just walk you through the entire step of making money, and at each step, we put the legal protections in place to make sure that money comes to you. That that's great. I, I'm laughing because the 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 example used with McDonald's and McDowell's kind of sidebar from. A oh, you like you like coming to America? Come on, it, it's cool. It's cool. It's a great example. It's a great example. The golden arches are the golden yeah. arcs. I yeah. get it. I get it. Um, Ray, you you use some terminology that we often um use uh, with with each other, but mm -hmm. of course startups particularly um, early stage startups don't really know some of that jargon. So you use some jargon, which I know what it is, but if you could just explain to us 
what an NDA is. Oh, I'm sorry, Ricky. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. So an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement or sometimes called a confidentiality agreement, right? And in essence, um, that agreement is the first agreement. It's the, the most popular agreement in business, right? And whenever you first sit down with an external party, it could be a potential funder, it could be a potential partner, it could be a potential supplier, it could be a potential manufacturing partner, it could be a potential uh, customer, it, it could be even a potential, you know, you're hiring a CFO or you're hiring a, 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 a outside CEO or you're hiring, you know, a chief marketing officer, right? And that non-disclosure agreement, you have them sign it and it all it essentially says, they could be one page, I've seen them 12 pages, right? You know two pages usually does, right? And all it says is, I'm gonna tell you my idea and you promise to only use that information I give you to do business with me, right? And if they don't agree to sign that non-disclosure, then you never, then you know that uh, their intentions are not, if you can't negotiate an NDA, you're never gonna negotiate a business deal, right? Because that's the first agreement in place to say, okay, we trust each other. I'm gonna give you some information. You're gonna give me some information we're going to brainstorm and we're going to figure out whether we're going to we're right for each other to do business and if we're right for each other to do business then we sign the second agreement it could be an employment agreement it could be a a funding agreement it could be a manufacturing agreement it could be a license agreement right so ndas all they say is we're going to sit down and talk and we're only going to use the information to decide whether or not we're going to do business with one another and if we decide to walk away then the information you learned you'll rip up you'll just, you know, delete the files and you'll move on and you won't take that information to somebody else. So that's an NDA or a confidentiality agreement. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. I have to remember, um, even when I'm speaking um, with entrepreneurs that they don't know our jargon. And so we have to just kind of make sure we know um, to just give them the the definition to find all those things. So sure, sure. Thank you. That was great. Um, I would ask before I bring some questions, because I know we're about halfway into our, our conversation and I do want to give um, Tashar another moment to if she has something to add. And then of course, bring in the audience and see if they have any questions. Um, I would like for you to share uh, a couple more things, Ray, um, with our entrepreneurs or our audience really, of just what are the, 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 the don'ts we always say what you you should do um, in the process of, of protecting your your invention or your uh, product. What are some of the don'ts? What don't you you need to do? Like, don't do this. Do not fall down this rabbit hole. Yeah. So, uh, Tashara mentioned the most important one, um, and it's you really need to file for patent protection once you have a, a you know a, a concrete plan of what your product or your new service is going to be you really need to file that patent application before you disclose it publicly and disclose it publicly could mean you know putting uh, uh, product details on a website it could be talking about it at a um, you know at a convention or at a conference or you know or um, you know writing a white paper about the product or service before you file that patent application. And the reason you, you need to do that is because um, the US law is forgiving, right? The, you know, you can disclose something publicly and they give you up to a year to file a patent application. But in many countries in the world, for example, in Europe, you have to file a patent application before you disclose it publicly. So if you uh, put it up on a website, and you have a year to file in the US, but you'll never be able to get a, a, a patent in, in Europe, right? And the US is not the only market. I mean, you know, we happen to be, you know, the, the largest market for most products, but you can imagine there could be some, um, let's say you're in a biotech space or, you know, uh, biopharma, you, you know, you, you don't own, only want to sell in the US, people get sick in Europe too, right? So you don't want to forego your rights abroad by prematurely disclosing the invention without having first filed a patent application. So that's a don't, right? Uh, the other thing is don't trust people, right? Don't trust people, right? If they wanna know what you're doing, they should sign a non-disclosure agreement, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a don't, right? Don't trust people. Um, you know, you should really get non-disclosures um, uh, in place. Um, and I would say another one is not really related to IP, 
but you have to separate yourself from the business, right? The business has to have a separate personality. It has to have a separate bank account. It has to have a, you know, separate formalities, right? So, you know, if you're going to start a business and want investors and people to take you seriously, you have to run it like a business, right? You know, you can't be putting your personal expenses and mixing things or, right? And, and if you have an idea for three businesses, then it needs to be three different companies, right? If not, they're not related. So you have to fo follow the, the corporate formalities if you want people to take you seriously. So I'll leave you with just those three don'ts. Well, Ray, just come and do my job. Why don't you? These are the things we tell entrepreneurs all the time, right, Tashara? Yeah, we tell, most we definitely. Tell, yeah, we tell entrepreneurs all the time, like when you're using the business model canvas, mm -hmm. one business model, one value proposition for one customer segment, like don't mix them all. So Ray, yeah. just come to St. Louis and just do my job, okay? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm in St. Louis, off, uh, 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 we'll be in St. Louis often visiting our, our St. Louis office. So uh, yeah, anytime I'm in town, I'm happy to come down and, and talk to folks and, and, uh, and uh, help you reinforce that message. I'll take you up on that. That's not good. <laughs> Tashar, thank you so much, Ray. Um, I'm going to bring it up for questions. If, Tashar, if you have any more to add? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely okay. wanted to throw out this acronym. Uh, it's an acronym that I learned quite often. Um, I'm sure I heard it in Square One Bootcamp and a few other um, webinars and seminars that I've attended. But when it comes to uh, bail, so in regards to what we were just talking about when it comes to the bank account and the attorneys, um, there are two other things that you have to consider. So the B stands for banker, A stands for accounting, I stands for insurance, and L stands for legal. And so that's something that when you are starting your company, something that you should highly have at the top of your priority list to one, get to know a banker, because it's always great to have somebody that you can call on. It's not just going to the tailor and making that transaction happen, but actually getting to know someone by name. Um, that will help you in the long run when you are looking for credit for your business. Um, in addition to accounting, you know, when it comes to the IRS, we want to make sure we have all of our ducks in a row because the IRS is not forgiving when it comes to you owing them money. So start off in the beginning um, with understanding some basic accounting terms and then connecting with an accountant, uh, whether it's someone who just is an accountant or they're a CPA. Um, in addition to insurance, connecting with an insurance agent for business insurance just to learn about it in the beginning and see when it will be the best time for you to purchase um, and buy a policy. And then the last thing is the main conversation is legal, you know, connecting with a business attorney, a patent attorney, whatever type of legal advice you need, make sure you address that in the beginning. Thank you so much, Tashara. Um, I want to thank both of you all for your awesome, awesome, awesome energy and your time. Um, but I would like to bring and invite the audience into the conversation. We've been talking a little bit and really just kind of feeling the way about some basic things with intellectual properties and do's and don'ts um, and kind of just familiarizing with some of the terminology. But if the audience has any questions, uh, I am opening things up for them at this time. I will say while, while we're waiting um, for questions that um, something I had mentioned earlier about not knowing everything. Uh, when I don't know something, I really do admit to I'm not familiar with this term. Um, I will ask somebody to educate me on that term or I will Google the information to find, you know, knowledge or videos or articles on it to help me to become abreast with that info. Um, so never ever feel like you aren't, um, I guess you don't know something and, and don't feel bad for not knowing. It is completely okay. Um, my background was not in tech when I first started my professional career. It was actually in entertainment. So transitioning over from radio industry into the tech and, and specifically wearable technology, there is a whole land of jargon that I was just not familiar with. So 
um, getting connected with individuals who may know that jargon and asking them questions, having a conversation, being open um, about not knowing is actually going to help you in the long run. Yeah, Thank, thanks for that, Tashar, because asking questions um, as they, may, whatever they may be, no question is a dumb question. So remembering that. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much. Um, with that, um, if whoever has, has a question, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and you can ask that question to either Tashar or Ray or even myself. Any questions from anybody? I guess we were abundantly clear. Yeah. I know, I know <laughs> we're not that good. I know, <laughs> I know we're not that good. Well, I guess I have a question for the audience. You know, um, for the audience, do you have a business already, or are you thinking about? starting a business. I'm just curious in regards to who we have in the audience. Um, and then, we do, yep, we do got a question also in the oh, chat. So. Okay, well, thanks to Shar, you, you kicked it off, right? <laughs> well, um, I see the question in the chat is, how much is the cost for intellectual property licensures? Or is it licensure or documents? How, how much is that average cost? Well, I, I'm not sure I, I totally get the question because um, is the question referring to how much does it take or what's the likely cost to obtain intellectual property protection? Or is it, uh, uh, you know, licensing intellectual property into your company? Because that's what uh, licensure uh, refers to. So I'm not sure which angle. Well, that's what it says. You can answer both, Ray. <laughs> okay. uh, so, um, you know, a typical patent, I mean, it's hard to say, but patent applications, depending on what city you're in, what lawyer you're using, how big the law firm is, you know, you could spend, you know, as little as, you know, $5,000 to about 15,000, depending on the complexity of the, of, of the product or what you're trying to protect. And again, you know, the size of the law firm or the, the you know, or what city you're in, you know, obviously like a, a lawyer in New York may cost more than a lawyer in Des Moines, right? Um, so that's just the case. Um, so that's for patents. You know, to, to file a trademark application, that's usually in the order of magnitude of around a thousand dollars. You know, um, NDAs. I mean, you know, typically you, you the, the there are templates out there, so it doesn't really cost you much. You know, an attorney may spend you know half an hour to an hour of time customizing it for your business or customizing it for a transaction. Um, but those are pretty, you know, those are usually cranking a form. So that's pretty inexpensive. Um, uh, let's see, you know, trade secret protection is free, right? You just keep it a secret, right? So the cost is really uh, maintaining the secrecy, right? Yeah, um, you know, so lock file cabinets or locking down your computers. So there's like a security cost, but the, but the right itself is, is free. And, uh, and copyright protection is, is free as well, right? As soon as the ink dries, it's copyrighted. You, know, you don't need to file for it. You don't need to apply for it. Um, you, know, you just put the little C in a circle, the date, the name, you know, all rights reserved. It's, you know, it's, it's copyrighted. Um, as far as licensing intellectual property, um, you know, sometimes you need other people's intellectual property to make a product, right? So here's a good example. Let's say uh, Tashara's business was pencils, right? And so she, let's say she invented the, the, me the mechanical pencil, right? And so she wants to sell mechanical pencils. She has the patent on that and she wants to go out and sell them for, you know, $2 each. Uh, but one day she gets the idea that she wants to put an eraser on top of that mechanical pencil, right? But another company owns the patent on the eraser. So if she wants to sell her mechanical pencil with an eraser on top of it, she has to license the patent for uh, the eraser before she can sell her product, okay? And then, you know, again, the rates for licensing vary according to industry, but the good rule of thumb is, you know, about 5% of sales is usually a royalty that you would pay 
So if Tashara is selling her pencils for $2, and then she sells her pencils with an eraser for $2.50, right? Then she probably would, uh, you know, the, the 50% cents that she could charge more, you know, 5% of that, she would probably pay as a royalty to the person that has the patent on the eraser. So that's a little, just a generalization. Thanks for the education. You gave me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here for. I'm here all day, folks. Here all day. <laughs> <laughs> we have some comments in the chat. Um, I think um, somebody replied back to the person in the chat wanted to know they have a 501c3 and kind of where they get started. And so I think some information was shared in the chat. Um, yes, I, will, I shared it, Ricky. <laughs> thank you so much, Tashar. I'll share my information in this chat as well. Just so if so, or if one of the panelists can share my information in the chat as well, just so that if anybody has a question, um, you can um, reach out to me. You can reach out to Tashar. Um, I think Ray just put his information in the chat. Any more questions? Any more questions? So I know I see that somebody said oh, that they're not receiving yeah. the information in the in the chat. Um, I can actually go go over briefly what I just mentioned. Okay. So so with the question, um, Vanessa, you were asking about starting a five hundred one c three, and I briefly just mentioned to reach out to Ricky. She has um, a lot of great resources that she can um, connect you with with starting one. And then I also suggested to connect with the St. Louis um, County Library, their business department, which also in Square One Boot Camp class they come and talk to you about all of the amazing resources that they have. Um, so that is another great resource. And then in addition to that, WashU and also St. Louis University, they have programs where their students will help you to get things prepared so that you can file for a 501c3. So I will also connect with those two entities too. Thanks to Shara. Um, Vanessa Robinson in the chat, we will contact you um, to give you some of that information since you're not getting the, the information in the chat. Are there any other further questions? This has been an amazing conversation. I'm like having a blast. Yes, it has been wonderful. I've been learning so much from Ray as well. And I love your energy too. So you just have to bring everything together that, you know, for someone as we talked about with the jargon, it actually brings it down so that it's um, intuable, I guess you could say, um, uh, information that people can digest it a lot easier. No, no, thank you. Yeah, no, I've been representing startups my whole career. So I, I, I think I've uh, been practicing law 23 years now. So, uh, and since day one, I, I graduated law school at the height of the dot-com boom and uh, re represented a lot of startups in Silicon Valley. So um, yeah, so it's a, it's a passion of mine and I know the space, definitely know the space. Definitely. And we can, and we can certainly tell that you know the space because I am listening, like being the moderator, I'm saying, wow, Ray, you're great, dude. You're great, Thank you. you're great. So Ricky, there's another question in the Q and A section. Um, if you see, um... I am trying to see. Okay, I got it. An anonymous attendee says, for a small business that might be expensive, a $5,000, that might be kind of expensive, that is correct. Is there a more affordable option to receive legal advice on IP? Uh, yeah, so I can answer that question multiple ways. So, um, you know, I say on the lower side to file a patent application might be, you know, five to 15K, depending on how um, complex the, uh, uh, the invention is. Um, you know, without getting into too much legalese, you, you know, there's something known as like a provisional patent application, which is a temporary patent application where you could just hold your place in line that you could usually get on file for like about a thousand dollars, but it's only temporary. It only holds your place in line. It, it never becomes a patent within a year of filing that, you have to file the quote unquote real patent application. So that, that's one legal tool to use to sort of uh, uh, wait until you have more funding available to file the real patent application. Um, 
And there are also, you know, uh, a lot of law schools have clinics where the, you know, students working with a, 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 a licensed attorney such as myself could help you file, uh, 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 you know, so, somewhat more cheaply. Um, but to be honest, um, you know, if you're going to do this, if you have the next million dollar idea and, and your funders believe in you, you know, I, I don't think any venture capitalist or angel investor or private equity investor uh, would not understand that you would need to raise funds and the first use of those funds is to file intellectual property. I mean, that's like kind of standard, right? Like, you know, when you watch Shark Tank, the, you know, Mark Cuban will say, Did you, do you have a patent? Uh, you know, do you have a, it's something on file. So, you know, the, the, the venture community understands that IP rights are expensive because, it, you know, it's a very complex area of the law. Um, and uh, so to the use of, uh, of those funds, when you raise your, you know, your angel funding or your series A to file for IP, everyone understands that need. And no one's gonna fault you for putting that in, in, as a line item when you're trying to raise money. I hope that answers the question. Ray, I'm, I'm really glad you answered it that way. And I wanna just offer uh, other resources um, in the ecosystem that we have. As Ray mentioned that we uh, have some of the clinics, um, law clinics, WashU has a law clinic um, that we often refer people to. Um, we also um, have had um, entrepreneurs to connect with um, legal services of Eastern Missouri, right on Forest Park. Um, so there, they also assist um, some entrepreneurs with some types of pro bono uh, types of services. And um, in, in that, uh, at, but at some point, the business, the idea will have to um, pay um, some fee for the services of legal. Um, but there are some different opportunities for entrepreneurs, small business folks to um, get some legal assistance um, within St. Louis. So WashU has a clinic. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, SLU also has a clinic and then um, legal services of Eastern Missouri. So if that is for anybody that's on, that's from St. Louis, those are some opportunities. And also with St. Louis, or even in the state of Missouri, you can reach out and get connected with Missouri Source Link. Missouri Source Link, Alexis Bartley, um, they have lots of opportunities. They have lots of resources and tools for early stage entrepreneurs um, in all of the fields as Tashara mentioned, bail, um, a banker, a county, um, you know, all of those things. So you, you just really, really, really um, take the opportunity to do some research with Missouri Source Link. And then of course, always remember to, um, you can always contact me just to get connected with those resources. Well, we got about 10 minutes. I don't know if we have more questions. Um, if we do, you can either unmute yourself, either put it in the chat, um, I'll give you a couple seconds to make a decision. Uh, I know that I have been, I've been in, in this space for about five and a half, six years, and Ray has just kind of like taken my job and balled it up in a circle <laughs> and kind of pitched it across the room. Um, so like, I don't know. I, I feel kind of good. I, I feel like I'm kind of doing something here, but Ray's done it, you know? Yeah, I, I think he is, you know, there's a lot of things to do, you know, running a business is complex, right? Whether the mm -hmm. business is, you know, a hundred dollar business or a hundred million dollar business. And, you know, and then you just have to break things into small chunks. It's like a math problem, right? You break it into a smaller problem that you can solve, you know, and so we've thrown a lot of information out here, but it's, but, you know, there's resources and there's steps and there's, and just take it one step at a time, you know, it doesn't have to be daunting, you know, so. Uh, I, I don't want people to be discouraged about uh, given the complexity of IP or insurance or banking and that kind of stuff. It's just, let's just take it one step at a time and do this. I definitely agree. I will say it was first starting 
a business, you're extremely excited about the idea and you may be talking to your family and friends about it. Some feedback is great. Some feedback may not be all that great or supportive, but with your excitement for the idea and the passion that you have for it is what's going to help you to keep going. And then when you are learning a lot of information, sometimes it can seem overwhelming. Um, one thing that I've found that helped me to get through learning all of this information is just taking a step back and just bullet pointing certain important things. And once again, prioritizing what is necessary. So the business model canvas that Ricky had talked about beforehand, that is something that will also be a great guide for anybody starting a business so you will understand where to start. Thanks to Shara for that. Um, Ray, to Shara, I want to thank you both so very much for um, taking this small portion of your day um, to share with the community, the entrepreneurs, small business, or just inquisitive individuals, just taking a moment to share your expertise and also just to share your journey uh, with them and with me. Um, it has been a blast. I have learned a lot. I thought I knew a lot, but I learned a lot uh, from Ray, from Tashara, definitely from the questions in the chat and just for, for being here. So I thank you um, for allowing me to be your host today. Um, Tashara, Ray, please don't be strangers. Please always, always, always know that you all are a family of the CET um, community. So if I will, I will bid everybody a good evening and thank you. Thank you so much, Ricky. Totally thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.